the message remains as timeless and as priceless as ever. As children, we all heard the same things over and over and over again. Don't run with scissors. Don't leave the refrigerator door open. Don't put your brother's head in the toilet. Please say please. Always say please and thank you. Look both ways before crossing the street. Eat all your vegetables. Do your homework first. Don't put the cat in the dryer. All these kind of things we heard over and over and over again. Our tendency was to respond, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've heard it all before. But there's a reason why some things are said over and over again. A reason why some things must be said over and over and over again. It's because we need to hear them. We need to hear the important things. We need to hear them over and over again because we don't always get it the first ten times that we heard it. And what are the important things we need to hear over and over again? Anything connected to God's love for us and our love for God and one another. That bears repeating over and over again. Put simply, some things cannot be said or heard enough. Like words, I love you. Such words are packed so chock full of life-giving meaning that they call out to be heard over and over again, 70 times 7. This is the case with this parable of the prodigal son. Sure, we've heard it before, over and over again. We may even think we know all there is to know about it, but that doesn't change the fact that the parable of the prodigal son is one of those all-important things we need to hear over and over again. Just like the words, I love you, the parable of the prodigal son is an unapologetic expression of God's radical, sacrificial, and extravagant love for you and for me and the whole world. So we're going to hear it again because we need to hear it again. Only this time, I'm going to try to tell it in a little different way, in a more contemporary fashion. There's a man with two children. The eldest was a girl, the youngest a boy. The man owned a car dealership and was out on the lot one day and his young uh, son came up to him and said, Dad, I want a Mercedes and I want uh, half of my, my half of the family fortune and then I'll get out of your hair. I'm going off to conquer the world and you'll never hear from me again. So the, the father regretfully and, and sadly divided up the money and got his son a Mercedes convertible and waved goodbye. A few days later, the son found himself at a blackjack table in Las Vegas, Sin City. Didn't take long for the young son to lose everything. All the money, the car, everything was gone. And with nothing left, and after nothing, uh, and after having been kicked out of a comped room at the casino, the young son found himself alone, completely and utterly alone. With nowhere to go and no money left, the young son was forced to hire himself out as a pool boy to the stars. It proved to be a horrible, horrible experience. But then one day the young son came to his senses. He looked around at what had become of his life and proclaimed out loud, How many of my dad's employees have it better than this? Here I am with nothing, barely existing And I can't get that uh, pool scent off of my skin. So I'll go to my dad and say to him, Dad, I really messed up. I mean, I really, really messed up. And I, well, I sinned. And I sinned against you. And I sinned against God. And I squandered everything. It's all gone. So I don't even have a peace offering to lay before you. But maybe, just maybe, you'll consider taking me back as one of your employees. So the young son went home. When his dad saw him coming down the road, he jumped for joy and ran out into busy traffic and put his arms around his son and gave him a noogie. Then the young son said to him, Dad, I really blew it. I messed up big time. I'm a loser. I sinned against you and God. I lost everything. Can I have a job? 
But the dad said, nonsense. And then his dad proceeded to tell one of the employees, run up to, the, run up to Saks Fifth Avenue. Get my son the best suit and the best shoes. Get him an iPhone, the newest version available. And then call the caterer because we're going to have a party. For my young son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And then the party began. Well, the elder daughter was in the lot selling cars when suddenly she heard something going on. She heard music over the loudspeakers, lots of laughing coming from the showroom. So the elder daughter called one of the employees and asked what was going on. And she, told, she was told that the, her loser brother had returned and dad was throwing a party for him. Well, that made her mad, really mad. So mad that she locked herself in a minivan and refused to come out. Her dad came out and pleaded with her to come to join the party, but she refused. Eventually, she rolled down the window and said to her dad, Dad, listen, I've been working here uh, myself to the bone all these years. You never threw a party for me and my friends. You never called the caterer for me. I've done everything you've told me to do and then some. You'd like to, uh, you'd, you'd think I would be the one that you were proud of and grateful for. Not this doofus over there. He comes home after carousing with prostitutes and losing everything, and you treat him like he's something special. What about me? Remember me? I'm the faithful one. Where's the justice? Have I been good all these years for nothing? I want to belong too. I want to be loved too. Will somebody please tell me how to earn your love? Then the dad said to her, Daughter, you are always with me. Everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and throw a party because your brother has come back. He is back with us. He was dead. And now he's alive. He was lost. And now he was found. You see, it doesn't really matter how you tell the story or what language you use for the story. The message remains the same. It doesn't, it doesn't matter how many times you've heard it before or how many different ways you've heard it be told. The message remains as timeless and as priceless as ever. But just what is the message? Is there just one message? Just one point to be made? What is it that Jesus wants us to hear? What is it that Jesus wants us to understand? <coughs> Excuse me. Why does the parable not have an ending? Where is the good news here? Well, we have been calling this parable the parable of the prodigal son forever. But what exactly does the word prodigal mean? Does it mean lost, wayward, rebellious? Or does it mean excessive, extravagant, lavish, unrestrained, wasteful? It means all of the above, which tells us the father is a, is a, product, is a prodigal in positive sense. He is excessive, extravagant, lavish, unrestrained, lovingly wasteful. The two siblings are prodigals in a negative sense. They're lost. They're wayward, they're rebellious, each in their own way. So maybe what we have is a family of prodigals. Maybe what we have is the church. If that's the case, then, we, then we're supposed to find ourselves in this parable. Where are you? Which character are you? Which, which one are you most like? Huh? Maybe you're a complex person and not limited to just one character. But find yourself in this parable. Where the church falls in is, you know, we have somebody who goes away from the church. They haven't been here forever. And then they show up. And everybody's like, would you just look at that? Look who's here. You know what he's been doing? No, that's, not, that's not what happens. No matter what we go and do, no matter what our sins may be, God takes us back. 
God will forever come back. That's why we, we, we confess of our sins. We say, I'm so sorry. And you mean it. And then the Father throws us a party. Not with fatted calf or with um, excessive alcohol, but throws us a party every time we come to the altar here for the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I don't know why this parable never ends. He leaves the parable that has no ending. We don't know what happens to the dysfunctional family, but the, the question really is in this parable is, do we observe our lostness? Who do we identify? Who do we, who are we most like? That's only a question you can answer for yourself. But just like everything else, we need to hear this over and over and over again to find out if we're like the young son, if we're like the old son, if we're like the father. This week as we go forward, may you think about those things as you're doing your daily activities. Who am I being most like? Amen.